station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is station. I am now ready for the event. Jesse PAO, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Rob Navius with JSC PAO. How do you hear me? Rob, it's great to hear your voice. I hear you loud and clear. Well, Mark, I'm glad to see you shaved for the occasion. Uh, you're looking great, and uh, we're looking forward to spending a few minutes here with you. Uh, appreciate your time. It's hard to believe that uh, this odyssey is almost coming to an end for you. Uh, you're wrapping up almost a year in space on the International Space Station. Last April, you knew there was a chance your mission could be extended to almost a year, but when it actually became a reality, what mindset did you employ to settle in for that long haul? Rob, I definitely had to put some thought into that. I uh, just tried to focus on being in the moment as much as possible to recognize that the only day I have is the day I'm in. Otherwise, it's very easy to try to think too much of the future or dwell too much on the past. Certainly, as humans, we have that wonderful capacity to plan, but it's very easy for us to spend too much time uh, worrying about the future and wondering how we're going to make it, when really all you got to do is make it through the moment you're in, and they just keep adding up, and eventually you get pleasantly surprised when you've managed to do something as long as this has worked out for all of us. Tell us a little bit about the rigors of a long-duration spaceflight, the mental challenges of taking things one step at a time, one day at a time, weekend after weekend, when things are a little slower than they may be during the course of a week. Well, you've certainly got to have good habits. You've got to practice a lot of positive self-talk. You've got to re remain connected to the people that those have such a significant relationships in your life back on the ground. You've got to, of course, maintain the friendships with the people that you have on Earth. We're all very social creatures, and that uh, certainly enhances our quality of life tremendously. I had to spend a lot of time, tried to make a habit of every day meditating. That certainly helped out a lot with keeping myself in a kind of a good, grounded frame of mind. And like I mentioned earlier, really the important thing was recognizing that I had to stay focused on what I was doing at the moment. And also, one more thing, trying to look for things to be grateful for as opposed to things to gripe about. That goes a long way with making whatever you're doing uh, more palatable. What were some of the high points and some of the low points of spending a year away from the home planet? Uh, my favorite moments, the highest points for, for me, were the times when I was just hanging around, usually around a mealtime with my crewmates, and laughing so hard we were in tears about some comment somebody made or just all of us contributing to a, a sense of humor and enjoying each other's company. Low points, uh, physically this is a challenging environment to be in. I've had a lot of congestion and headaches. When there's times when you just feel very physically uncomfortable, those are probably the low points. It, it colors everything you're doing, and it takes a lot more work to uh, stay in the right frame of mind in those situations. You know, uh, we're often asked, uh, with uh, seven or more people on board the International Space Station at any given time, it's hard to believe that you'd be lonely, but were there moments of solitude or loneliness that you had to work your way through during the past year? Actually, I don't think so. When, I, when you put in perspective how many challenges people have had because of COVID and all the periods of time when we've been isolated in our homes with very few people, in a way I've been fortunate. All of my needs have been met, including a lot of social needs with usually at least seven people on board, so people to live and work with every day. And they're wonderful people, so that was certainly a highlight for me. Um, so compared to what we've had to deal with on the ground, I certainly haven't felt like it's been a tougher situation as far as dealing with loneliness. And our behavior, health, and performance group does a fantastic job of helping us stay connected with our loved ones on the ground and even um, being able to talk to new people that I wouldn't normally have gotten the opportunity to talk to. You know, Mark, uh, when you come home, you will have flown uh, almost 151 million miles 
the equivalent of 312 round trips to the moon. You saw international and commercial vehicles come and go from the station, representing multiple agencies and corporations throughout your year in space. Are we looking at your year in orbit as a microcosm of what human spaceflight will be in the future? I would say it's only the beginning. I, I believe that the, all of the investments NASA's put into trying to make low Earth orbit a commercially viable place, a place where businesses will be successful, is going to open up the opportunities for people to go into space much more frequently. My hope is that someday, just as we've had people coming and going of all different nationalities and professions on the space station, that as we push the boundaries of humans' existence to even having a permanent presence on the moon someday, that that also becomes a place someday where there are commercial enterprises happening and we learn more and more about what it means to live in this universe as we expand further and further out. And as a follow-up to that, Mark, uh, you're coming home right before the arrival of the first private astronaut mission uh, by Axiom to the ISS. But you did see private citizens fly to the station, including a Russian actress and her producer. How has space opened up the door for what some would call the ordinary person or a non-professional to fly to and from space? It certainly did. As you can imagine, having new people arrive on the space station without as much training as, as professional astronauts receive, we had some concerns about how they would adapt. And they adapted amazingly well. In fact, their enthusiasm of being up here and getting the opportunity to experience this, the sense of gratitude they brought with them, was really uh, um, energizing for us up here. So it, it was always, it was only twice, and certainly there could be personalities that would make the situation more challenging. But I'm very happy to say that the four guests that we had, non-professional astronauts while I was on board, were all really a pleasure to get to live and work with. Mark, let's talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of landing day. Uh, undocking in the Soyuz MS-19 for you and your crewmates will be a little bit different than we typically see. There's station keeping that will be built in to allow uh, Piotr Dubrov to uh, capture photography and videography of the station before you depart for good. Uh, can you discuss that aspect of your landing day and what's involved? Sure. In fact, I suspect it will be very similar to what we did when the crew on my Soyuz was myself, Oleg Nowitzki, and Pyotr Dubrov. When we did a fly around just to get to a new docking port, Pyotr in that situation also had to take photos. So I suspect what will happen is Pyotr will, will change his orientation as he gets out of his seat. So he's kind of laying across uh, the commander's lap so that he has enough room to open the hatch. It's very, very tight in the descent module where all three of us were located. And then once he gets that hatch open, he'll just be able to kind of sit up and drift up into the habitation compartment. He'll spend some time up there because there's a window that will face uh, towards the space station and he'll take pictures from that module. Meanwhile, I'll be sitting and uh, looking out the window over my right shoulder, trying to soak it all in. and. Anton will be actively monitoring and flying the spacecraft. When Piotr is done with his photos, he'll return, same, just doing everything I just described in reverse, and he'll be back to business as usual. And so when you back away from the station for good, this place that has been your home for a year, what do you think will be going through your mind as you bid farewell to this huge complex that uh, you've lived and worked in? That's a tough one to answer. I'm sure I'll have lots of conflicting emotions. Enthusiasm for the opportunities back on the earth to see my family, to be present physically with my wife where I haven't seen her, I haven't been in her vicinity since January of last year. So that'll be wonderful. But at the same time, I'll also recognize that this will be the end of a phase of my life. I'm pretty confident that I will not be, in fact, I promised my wife I will not be flying to space again. So that will be, uh, bittersweet. I'm very, very grateful to have had this amazing opportunity to come up to the space station, to be up here with such wonderful people who I will consider friends for the rest of my life, to serve my country and all of humanity. Um, but so there will be gratitude for that, enthusiasm for the future, and a little bit of sadness too, because 
I'll be shutting the door on that. I won't be able to come back, and this is a very, very special place. Mark, this will be your second landing in a Soyuz spacecraft. Knowing now the dynamics of a Soyuz entry and landing and how that all works, can you walk us through what one astronaut once called a ride comparable to an e-ticket at Disneyland? Sure, I will definitely do that. So um, the first surprise for me on my last return to Earth, my last descent, was how funny it feels when the hooks are unlatched from the space station and you feel like you're the cork being popped off a bottle. You just get there's kind of a popping sensation, you just start drifting away. We don't fire any thrusters. It just feels very, very gentle as we drift away from the space station. After some time, we reorient and do the deorbit burn. Not very dramatic there until we get low enough where t so we start interacting with the atmosphere. And then you can see lots of flashes of light as uh, the, the well-designed spacecraft has parts that burn away to help get rid of all that energy and to pass successfully through the heat of reentry. And then there's this long period of waiting for the parachute to open. Last time, I was not aware of how afraid I was about what was going to happen as you're just waiting to find out if you're going to live or die because it all depends on whether that parachute opens up. I didn't realize how scared I probably was until I felt this incredible glee as I was getting shaken all over the place as the parachute opened up in a, or in, nominally in a uh, position where the spacecraft again nominally starts to oscillate violently back and forth. But some people that's very nauseating for. For me, I was, I just had a wonderful sense of glee because I knew it was working out for us. And then after that, uh, it's a, uh, again, you have to have some patience while you're waiting to hit the ground. The uh, search and rescue forces, I expect, w assuming the weather's good enough for them to be able to see us, will help us uh, by telling us how far above the ground they think we are at, at, while we're watching our data on the spacecraft. This time I'll make extra sure that my head is in the seat because we really hit very, very hard. Hard enough where when I hit the ground, my first emotion was anger that uh, I would be hit that hard. It was all fine. No problems, no health problems as a result. The spacecraft worked very, very well. But I will not forget that emotion. And then there's another, there's some moments of waiting. Uh, last time we were on the plains of Kazakhstan in February, I was looking forward to smelling the uh, the smell of dirt and vegetation, but on the steppes of Asia in February, there was just ice and the smell of uh, helicopter fuel as the helicopters that were helping get all the resources to us were in our vicinity. This time being later in the year, I'm hoping I might get a little bit of a smell of a spring. We'll see. And uh, that's the whole story. You're landing uh, about uh, not quite two and a half hours before sunset on uh, March 30th, and they were told the temperature is going to be in the 50s Fahrenheit, so it's probably not going to be as icy as you experienced the first time around, but assuming you get the opportunity to get those smells and the sensations, what's really the first thing or the one major thing you're looking forward to the most uh, once you get back on Earth? Uh, making a cup of coffee for my wife and myself and then sitting in bed and talking to each other while we're either reading or catching up on the news. Just having relaxing Saturday mornings is a wonderful thing. And then after that, i probably say guacamole and chips. Mark, a final question. We always ask this ethereal question, but in a big picture sense, if you uh, sit down in the weeks, months, years ahead to write the legacy of the ISS from your perspective, particularly for this past year, what would be your impression, your thoughts about the lasting legacy of the International Space Station? I think we will always look back on the International Space Station as being a fantastic example of what humanity can do when we cooperate like we do on the space station. This is a very challenging time for international relations. My hope is that in our attempts to, to further and find peace throughout the world, that these type of connections that we have can be maintained and find and serve as a path forward to try to find that common ground that we need so desperately to find peace. 
Mark Vandehei, uh, it's been a pleasure to be working with you again and over the past year on this, uh, your second uh, space flight. Uh, your name etched in the in the history books of U.S. human spaceflight, certainly. We appreciate everything you've done and wish you all the best and soft landings in Kazakhstan. Thanks, Rob. You mind if I ask you a question? Are you going to be there in Kazakhstan when I land? Actually, I will not. I'm going to be anchoring your coverage on NASA TV all the way from farewells all the way through the time you're in the medical tent. Bill Ingalls, our ACE headquarters chief photographer, he'll be there to capture the moments in history, both from the helicopter as uh, you guys descend under your chute, as well as on the ground, and he'll be flying back uh, on the Gulf Stream with you uh, back uh, to Ellington. So uh, we'll see you when you get back home, and I'll look forward to uh, every moment of those broadcasts to record uh, this moment in history with you. Thanks, Rob. It's a really a wonderful team, and I, I can't say enough about how much it's meant for me to be able to participate as part of this great team that can make things like this happen. Thanks again. Thank you, Mark, and uh, be safe. You as well. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.